Hello, happy Monday. We're off to another week, another week in this crazy coronavirus pandemic. Anyway, hope you're hanging in there. Today, we're back in the sacristy. I thought I would show you some of the vestments that I wear. I'm not sure if you know the names or have any interest, but I thought I'd give it a try. So let's go check out a few of the vestments uh, that I wear. This is called an alb. It's the white garment that you see us wearing underneath um, everything else. You can usually see it because it's kind of, if you look down by our toes, you'll see this white sticking out or maybe our sleeves. Then over that garment, there's what's called a cincture. This is bright red, usually they're white. But this cincture goes around the waist, and one forms a loop, pulls it through, and tightens it up. And that helps the alb to come up from the floor so that one doesn't trip on it. That's called a cincture. The next vestment is called a stole. You should kiss it before we put it on and when we take it off. And it represents the priesthood. Let's see how the stole lays down like that. And then the chasuble. The chasuble is the big vestment worn over the top of everything else that you see me wear at Mass. But these are the things I wear. What about a deacon? Well, the deacon also wears vestments and he wears a stole as well. But his stole looks different. You can see it has a kink in it. Not just because deacons are off, they're not off. They just have a kink in their stole, so they can wear it like this, so people know that they are a deacon. They don't wear a chasuble, but they can wear something called a dalmatic. And it's different because you see it has arms, right? Where mine didn't have arms. So that's called a dalmatic. Let me show you another really fancy vestment. This vestment is called a cope. You wear it like this. I think of it as my Superman cape. And I wear it for things, maybe sometimes a baptism or a marriage or Eucharistic adoration. I'll sometimes wear it. It's called a cope. And over the cope, something called a humeral veil can be placed. Let me get that. Here's the humeral veil, and it drapes up over the back like that, if you can see. Matches into place. And you can see there's little pockets in here, right? So I put my hands in the pockets, and then I'm able to grab the Eucharist, especially the monstrance, to do a blessing for benediction, for instance. That's called the humeral veil. Let me show you just a few more things um, here in the church. Here is an incenser. Right. Yeah, you see this thing putting off all that smoke that sometimes makes us cough. But smoke is a, an ancient thing that was used um, by the Jewish people. It represents in a beautiful way God's presence as well as our prayers lifting up to God. And so we put a live charcoal in there that we light, and then we take what's called the boat, and then um, it, that has granular incense uh, within it. And so that incense is placed upon the coal, and it burns. Well, hopefully you have all those names memorized now. We're going to move now on to our retreat. Before we do so, I'm just going to show you once again the little clip on confessions. They start today, uh, those drive-through confessions. So here's a little sneak peek of what you might expect if you come here Monday through Friday from 5 to 6 p.m. at night. Drive-through confessions. 
It's the latest craze in this coronavirus epidemic. You drive up, Father hears your sins, you get them confessed, and you drive off all behind a screen. It's so great to join you again on this at-home retreat. I truly hope this has been a blessing so far and that there are many more graces to come. Yesterday I spoke about repetitions. I was wondering if you already have had a chance to dive into that or if you have yet to kind of pray a prayer period doing repetition. I hope that when you do, if you haven't already, that it would be very graceful. Remembering again that a repetition is trying to find some place where the Lord has spoken to you in some way and responding and returning back to that passage. This, generally speaking, is a very positive place of grace, feeling the Lord's love, His warmth, His closeness. But it can also be a place of resistance. Even if I mentioned in that just made up example of being held, being handed the Christ child and being resistant, like what's going on? Like I'm not comfortable holding Jesus. This can be a tricky part to kind of know, like should I do a repetition on this or not? But if we notice there's something not quite right in us, that we're resisting some movement from God, that's a great place to stay for the Lord to penetrate through whatever kind of hardness of heart or woundedness we might have in that area. So I really encourage you and will likely bring up this repetition stuff again and again so that it really um, becomes just second nature to you. In this though, it kind of presupposes something, doesn't it? It presupposes the ability to hear God. I want to speak today then about this sense of like, how do I hear God in my life? What does he sound like? Is it even possible? Let me emphasize at the beginning of this to this this whole sense that we have to I mean like listen to God. If prayer is going to be a dialogue, it's us talking, but it's also us listening. So as we listen, let us hone in on those ways that God does speak to us. Now, God is completely capable of speaking audibly. He does many times in scriptures. Can you think of a few? For instance, when they're on Mount Sinai, God speaks from the mountain and they're terrified. And they say, Moses, you go and you speak to God and we'll do whatever he says. We hear God's voice in a little bit different kind of way as well. When Jesus is baptized and he comes out of the water and he says, and God the Father says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. We hear Similar words, don't we, at the transfiguration. So God can do this, but oftentimes it's not his normal means of communication. I want to introduce to you four ways that just seem really kind of consistent ways that the Lord speaks to us. One of these ways is through our mind. Oftentimes coming as words that in our mind we'll hear in a, a certain clarity words spoken to us. We can be praying and, and we hear God saying, I love you, or I'll take care of this, or whatever it might be. This is certainly one of the ways that the Lord speaks to us. So we want to be attentive, particularly with all of these. Be attentive to the things that come from outside of you. Right? Like, this didn't seem to really come from me. That's what you want to hone into, because that's where we can find the voice of God versus just us talking to ourselves. And if you don't quite get it, don't know, keep kind of staying there. It might start out as a little whisper, but it gets louder and louder, and it becomes quite clear. Another area that we can hear the Lord speaking to us, maybe the most profound way that seems to be easiest to recognize is through our emotions. We as human beings have emotions. They're actually gifts to us from God. 
And so sometimes the Lord speaks to us through our emotions, meaning He'll take our emotions and He'll He'll turn them. We'll all we'll feel anxious, and as we're praying, this peace will just overcome us, or love enters in. We're not able to control our emotions so easily, and so it can be a great way to hone in on on God, something outside of us, this force, the spiritual force, moving our emotions within us. And it can be the way that God tells us different things, like He loves us or He's going to take care of things. Right? I mentioned, maybe you're anxious about something and you bring it to prayer, and you're anxious most of the prayer, but then all of a sudden, something happens. Maybe even words come, but you notice in your emotions this sense of great peace. We can really put words upon that and, and we can recognize that God's telling me He's going to take care of me. This is going to be okay. So that would be uh, a means of how the Lord uses this type of um, way of speaking to us through changing our emotions. Another one would be through our imagination. Actually we spoke about that some yesterday, didn't we? That God can shape our imagination and he does. That as we're praying along, particularly like I said in the Gospels, he can move and shape that imagination to be able to speak and say certain things to us. So once again, we're looking for not just our ordinary means of imagining, but when we can say like, I would have never imagined that. Then we can say, ah, the voice of God is close here at hand. The last one that I want to mention is this whole sense of desire. That this is another way that the Lord can enter into our hearts and, and stir um, them up. He can give us holy desires. A desire to be near to the Lord, to seek Him in prayer. Where would something like that come from? It actually comes from God. And so He, he brings these desires to actually fulfill them story I like to tell with this is, is just an example of a, a father and his son driving through the countryside, right? And on this trip, it's a hot day, and he says, looks over to his son and says, hey, isn't it really hot today? Wouldn't, it, wouldn't ice cream be nice? The son says, yeah, yeah, ice cream would, I would love some ice cream. Do you see any places to get ice cream? No? Okay. They go driving along and the father is well aware as they pass through this little town of a certain shop. And so he points it out to the son and says, Son, what's that? Dad, Dad, that's an ice cream place. Can we stop? Can we stop? Yeah, we can stop. Let's get an ice cream cone. The father purposely put this desire of, of ice cream in his son's heart so that he could fulfill it and, and bring him some happiness. So too, this is God bringing into our hearts a certain desire, a certain longing for, for holiness or to pray. I bet you've felt that before. But maybe you've never thought of that actually as God himself, the Holy Spirit, stirring within you and speaking to you. So I've mentioned to you then four different ways, right? Through our mind, through our emotions, through our imagination, and through our desires different ways that the Lord speaks to us. And there can be a variation of this. You know, words that calm, emotions that stir, imagination that stirs, along with certain emotions that come with it. And in these, we can recognize the presence of God. Maybe it's a certain vision, a certain image of God, or just sometimes even just a sense, like the Lord is sitting right beside me, or sometimes a touch. I've had that happen. It's really pretty cool, you know. The Lord loves us and He's looking for all different ways to reach out and to, to actually draw us in. So in prayer, as we begin to listen, as we give Him time, we'll begin to hear. We'll begin to, to sense the Lord's presence. And when we do, even if it's very slight, pay attention to it. And then we turn back and into it and say, Lord, 
What are you saying? Within the prayer itself? After the prayer? In a sense, throughout the day? And, and bringing us into the next prayer period where we would do a repetition on it? So I ask you then, with a renewed sense of appreciation for, for God and the way He speaks to us, to enter into prayer with a, a desire to hear Him, to enter into prayer with attentiveness, with an expectation. Why not expect that the Lord is going to show up? He does. He wants to speak to you. But oftentimes there's a lot of resistance on our part. Let us give way. As I said at the very beginning of this, let us relax and let the Lord lead us. Not worried about whether we hear Him today or tomorrow or in some other day. But let us be attentive to, to whatever the Lord wants to do. And in that, we're going to find great happiness and encounter with Him. Many blessings.